Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Hammurabi in our continuing study of the history of civilization. Uh, when we come to Mesopotamia, um, just by way of reminder, uh, we have Sumer in southern Mesopotamia, uh, Assyria in the north, uh, Elam is going to be to the east of Sumer, uh, both into the valley and, and up into the Zagros Mountains. Uh, Aram, uh, the, the, sometimes we talk about how we have the Aramaic language uh, that was became used as some sort of a lingua franca, uh, that is a common language uh, by the first millennia. Now we're not there yet, uh, but we already see Aram with its capital in Damascus. Uh, and of course Egypt we've talked about and we're, we're going to keep coming back to Egypt because even though it's sort of far removed uh, from Mesopotamia, um, we're going to see uh, some interaction between the two. And finally we'll actually have a separate class uh, just on the Hittites. Now the Akkadian period, and this is by way of review, uh, we had uh, 2330 BC, uh, Sargon the Great, and he had managed to to uh, occupy and to sort of coalesce and to, to unite uh, the kingdoms of Mesopotamia. Uh, but that's followed by the Guti invasion, and everything falls apart for a hundred years or so. Uh, but then in 2100 BC, the Sumerians grab, uh, drive out the, the Guti, and now we have the Sumerian... Uh, the third dynasty of Ur, it's sort of the last hurrah for the city of, Hur, for, of Ur and the, and the Sumerians. Um, and it's from this time, uh, around this time, that Abram uh, leaves Ur of the Chaldees and he goes to settle in Haran and eventually comes down to Canaan. Now also in 2000 BC, when, when Abram is doing that, th there's a lot of other people on the move as well. Uh, there's Indo-Europeans that are coming down into what we call the Greek Peninsula today. Um, the Amorites are moving into Mesopotamia and just just sort of messing up things. Uh, Indo-Europeans coming across the Bosphorus and entering into Anatolia, uh, where they're going to disrupt things. And, and as a result, we're going to see eventually the Hittite Kingdom uh, established there. Be from 2000 to 1800 BC, we have the Isin Larsa period, named because we have two major cities. They're sort of competing, uh, sort of back and forth. Isin Larsa, and these are Sumerian cities, um, um, and this is the time of city states when when no no one uh, city it has all the power, has all of the authority. Uh, things are going sort of back and forth and. Uh, and Assyria is growing in the north. In fact, this is going to be the growth of Assyria, but then, then we're going to see them almost take a back seat. The heyday of Assyria is going to come, come much later. And it's now that we want to talk about our topic, and that's Hammurabi. His death around 1750 BC, a uh, nice round number where we can remember that. Uh, he succeeded his father to the throne of Babylon. Remember, Babylon was already an old city, but it had never been of any great importance up to this point. It, you know, there had been other cities overshadowing it. Uh, and he leads a coalition against the Elamites. Uh, Elamites are always messing up things uh, down uh, in southern Mesopotamia. Uh, and, and he goes on to unify Mesopotamia. He's, he's the right man at the right time. And, and he brings Mesopotamia together under his rule. Uh, the city-states are replaced now by regional states. Uh, instead of a whole lot of uh, individual cities, we're going to have regions and the idea of kingdoms and, can we call them that, countries. Uh, Hammurabi is known for his law code, and so we need to talk about the law code of Hammurabi. This isn't the first law code ever, ever made, but it's the most complete that we have found. The law code of Hammurabi uh, is found on a, a large stella. Remember, a stella is like a stone monument rounded on, on top. Um, and uh, this was found at Susa by De Morgan in 1902. Um, when you look at it, uh, at the top, Hammurabi is the one pictured standing. He's standing before the 
God and and as if that he he, he claims actually that he's getting the laws from from you know whichever God he's speaking to. Um, it portrays a caste system. Um, you know, you've got the nobles and the commoners and then the slaves. Um, it, it's a system what we call in Latin lux talionis, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, and, it is, and it's very literally along those lines. Um, it sets the standard of wages. Um, there's, you know, you know how today in our country uh, we have minimum wage. Well, here it's not minimum wage, it's maximum wage. It's, it's uh, set, you know, what's going to be standard, standard for certain wages. Um, there is a trial by ordeal that's mandated where if uh, you don't know if somebody's guilty or not, you throw them in the river. And if they manage to swim, then okay, I guess he's not guilty. If he, if he sinks, if he can't swim, uh, well, he must have been guilty. Uh, if, he, if he can swim, he, then not guilty, and, and he's released. Um, in this trial of ordeal, here it is. If anyone bring an accusation against a man, and the accused go to the river and leap into the river, if he sinks uh, in the river, his accuser shall take possession of his house. But if the river prove that the accused is not guilty, and he escape unhurt, then he who has brought the accusation shall be put to death while he who leaped into the river shall take possession of the heart house that had belonged to his accuser. So, so if you accuse somebody and they can swim, well then you're out of luck uh, because you must have been brought a false accusation. Uh, you, you can see where, where um, there's just some imbalance <laughs> in, in this law. Now, it also contains an entire section of marriage laws. Uh, um, adultery was forbidden. Uh, marriage was only legal when it was in writing. If it, if you know, it didn't matter if you, if you had a cer ceremony or promises. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Um, there, the penalty for adultery is death. Um, death for for both parties. Um, wives were permitted to own property, um, both on their own right, but then also if their husband had died, uh, they could take the property and and pass it on to their children if, if they so de desired, but they didn't have to do that. Um, veils were mandated. Um, you know, you sometimes we look at the Middle East today and we think that's, you know, something new. No, that goes back 4,000 years. You know, long before Islam, long before Muhammad, um, women, women were to be uh, veiled. Uh, monogamy was mandated. Um, one husband, one wife, except in the case of a wife who was barren, then a husband was permitted to take a second wife in order to, to have in order to have children. Now there were also laws for doctors, for physicians. Um, if a physician wanted to charge, you know, again, they didn't have minimum wage; they had maximum wage. So the payments uh, to, toward your doctor, towards your physician, was scaled for the healing of a citizen. Uh, that would be like a noble person, uh, ten shekels. For a freeman, uh, uh, he would have to pay five shekels. For a slave, um, two shekels would be paid um, if he w had to go to the doctor. Uh, on the other hand, if you went to the doctor and you got worse, or if the patient died, then the physician was actually punished. Not only did he, uh, could he not charge, um, that punishment could be rather harsh. In the case of a citizen or a freeman, the physician's hand was cut off. Um, you don't want your patient dying on you. Uh, you, could, you could be in serious trouble. Uh, in the case of a slave, uh, it w you had to pay the cost of the slave um, because you had it was it was considered malpractice if your patient died, um, and so you pr you probably wanted to be a little careful about what patient you might treat. Now you've you've probably noticed that there are some similarities between the Code of Hammurabi and the Mosaic Law. Uh, differences too, for, to, for sure. Um, the Code of Hammurabi is, is overtly polytheistic, uh, it postulates a number of gods, the Mosaic Law is there's only one god, but there's some similarities. Uh, they both have penalties for things like murder and adultery, kidnapping, bearing false witness, stealing, um, and even, even the penalties in these cases, 
um, are very much alike. Um, and yet in the Code of Hammurabi, most punishments are capital punishments, or sometimes, you know, you're just cutting off a hand. Remember, we talked about the, the physicians. In the Mosaic Law, the punish, I think the punishment better fits the crime. You know, yes, if you kill somebody, you're, you're forfeiting your life. Um, uh, yes, the pun pun uh, punishment for adultery, uh, likewise, was death. But there were other punishments that were not capital punishments under the Mosaic Law. In the Code of Hammurabi, uh, it was punishment-oriented, therefore. And yes, there were punishments in the Mosaic Law, but it was more to protect the innocent party or to protect God and his honor. Uh, in the Code of Hammurabi, uh, mercy was very rare. Uh, we often see mercy, though, in the case of the Mosaic Law, where somebody's given a second chance. In the Code of Hammurabi, there's uh, the trial by ordeal. You know, th you know, throw the guy into the river. <laughs> if he sinks, then he's guilty. Um, in the Mosaic Law, uh, much more normative is the evidence of two or three witnesses, um, and so you know it, it goes it goes to a a standard of justice that's much more much more just and much more in keeping with our standard of justice uh, in in our countries today. In the Code of Hammurabi, uh, I would say man is at the center of these laws. It's how to get along with other people. Um, the Mosaic Law, remember, the first four commands all have to do with God. And so he's really at the center of these laws, and then the others relate to, to, to people, uh, but it's relating to people who are made in the image of God. Um, Hammurabi, remember there, there were laws about uh, you know, dams, if, uh, if a farmer didn't uh, stop the water from flowing, and if he didn't keep up his dam, uh, he could be penalized. Uh, they, they don't have any dams in, in Israel or in, out in the desert when in the Sinai where, where, where the law was given. Uh, so instead, there's laws about, you know, if, if a man burns his field and then by mistake he, he burns the field of his neighbor, he, he is responsible. He has to pay that up, uh, pay that back. Uh, and yet even there, if he's unable to pay, uh, he's not put to death, uh, as would be the case in the Code of Hammurabi. Um, in the Code of Hammurabi, uh, there is no provision made for the poor. Um, in the Mosaic Law, you, the people were told specifically, when you, when you farm your land, don't farm all of it. Uh, that is, um, leave the outer edges. That's for the poor. And if you happen to drop a bale of grain, oops, I, I dropped that. Just leave it there. That's for the poor. Uh, so there's provisions that are made for the poor. Not so in the days of Hammurabi. Code of Hammurabi, uh, the penalty for harboring a runaway slave was death. In the Mosaic Law, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 15, uh, actually protected runaway slaves. They were not to be returned to their master. Um, there was a protection there in place. Uh, in the Code of Hammurabi, the slave who said, you don't own me, uh, had his ear cut off. Um, by contrast, we have this ceremony in the Mosaic Law where a slave who loved his master and didn't want to leave his master actually had his ear pierced as a sign, I belong uh, forever uh, to my master. I reminded my granddaughter about having her pierced ears, what, what that means, and I'm not sure if she really, uh, if she really cared for that idea. Um, in the Code of Hammurabi, uh, good intentions, for example, here's a phys physician that tries to heal somebody and that person dies. Um, he's going to lose his, either his life or, or his hand. Um, in the Mosaic Law, good intentions like that are not punished. And so um, there, there's some similarities, yes, but there's also some very serious differences.